excited to be here. This is definitely different than I, I taught two classes earlier in the day, and graduate students and undergraduates, and, and you know, some of them are love to be there, and some of them are asleep in the back of the room. But you all look like you're awake, so which is really nice, considering it's five. So let me just start by saying why I said yes to come and, and, and talk to you. <laughs> so I, I am a microbiologist at Iowa State. I've worked with plant-associated bacteria all of my career. And um, I think it was a few years ago that I started really, really internalizing what it meant that the global world population was, was going to be 9.6 billion by, by 2050, and that we were going to have to double our production of food by that point. And you start to think about that, and it just starts to get you scared, especially when you're looking at your kids and thinking, how are they going to be eating? And you look at climate change, and I work in a plant pathology department, so I see a, the, the, the pathogens that are moving and a, and a national interest in emerging pathogens, and, and we're all scared about those. And it made me think, I, I, I need to learn more about this, but when I've looked at how agricultural research has worked in the last 100 years, I'm really impressed at all of the yield gains that have happened year after year after year. You get these 3.64% yield gains. And then you look at the last 20 years and you see these yield gains are not those yield gains that, that we used to have. They're, they're 1.8, 2. And you realize that just when we need that much more food, we're getting that much less yield. And you all know this, but it made me think we've, we've maxed out on how close you can get your corn plants together. We've maxed out on how much input you can have. We need another perspective. We need something, a new tool. We need to use every tool in our toolbox to grow. And one of the tools that I think is least appreciated are the microbes. The microbes have evolved with, with animals. They've evolved with plants. They've, they've done this in order, um, <laughs> well, from then it's just to survive. But we have the opportunity to look at those relationships and see if we can exploit them to help us out. And we haven't traditionally done this in our plant breeding programs. They, they ignored the microbes. We haven't done it in, in most of our programs. And so, I decided that at the very least I can teach people a little bit about what microbes do. And I'm actually in a, um, a, a position where I go to Washington a lot and talk to all the federal funding agencies and try and get funds to help us learn more. Because what we're really at a point is where we need to learn a lot more. So what I'm going to teach you is just the drop of what we know, but there's so much more. So, One of the things to recognize is that plants initially were in the oceans, and when they came up and on land, they evolved over time with the microbes. The microbes were here first. They were already exploiting them in order to live on the land. So it's a very, very long partnership that's evolved, which means there's a lot for us to learn if we haven't looked at it from that perspective, because there's been a lot of specific interactions and general interactions that we, some we know and many we don't. So if you look at a, a plant, and I'm only talking about plant agriculture here, the um, microbes are going to be all over that plant. The question is not where they are, it's really how much there are. There's, there's a lot of microbes on the roots. There's a lot of microbes in the roots. There's some microbes on leaves. There's not very many in leaves. But you find them off everywhere. So they're going to be on stems. They're going to be in the seeds. They're in the pollen, the fruits, the flowers. These plants are depending on these microbes to do things for them. And the more we've learned, it's really only in the last 10 years we've really been looking at the ones inside the plants, the more we've been impressed at the kinds of things they're doing. So crop yields can be influenced by microbial partners. Um, we, we know this with rhizobia. It's probably true with a lot more microbes than we've recognized to date. So who are the microbes? So how many of you have had any training in microbiology? A class, an interest? Good. So there is, there's lots of you. So for those of you who haven't in particular, I'm going to introduce you to the different microbes. But also for those of you who have, I'll put it in the context of plants. 
So when we think about um, who the microbes are, the bacteria are my favorites because I work with those. But you can have a lot of bacteria. Sometimes it's mind-blowing. Up to about 10 billion cells per gram of soil. 10 billion, and those are not all the same. <laughs> There's lots of different ones in that 10 billion. And if you look along a root, these are some of my favorite images. You, can, you know root cells come down and they have little crevices. So in those crevices, you can have these piles of, of bacteria that are coated almost like jello. In, and, and, and that jello is helping keep them moist, but it's also helping keep the, the root moist. On a leaf, you have a lot fewer bacteria, like 100 million per gram on, at the most. And whereas the roots are kind of coated, if you take if you want to look at the distribution of bacteria on a leaf, you need to think of an aerial view of Iowa at night. And you're going to see a lot of lights in Des Moines, and you're going to see a lot of lights over in Sioux City, but you're not going to see them in most of the rest of the places. That's what bacteria grow like on a leaf. They all grow in one, one spot, and then you have some out, but it's kind of a desert. They're, they're very cosmopolitan in that. And these bacteria that you find on the roots and the leaves have a very broad range of, of genetic diversity. Um, their functional diversity. And that's some of the exciting things that we're learning about. So the fungi are also present at about a million cells per gram of soil which when you look at an entire field and you think a gram of soil is the end of the, your thumb, that's a lot of fungi. And they are forming these networks that are extending throughout the soil. These have also been found um, in most plants, in, in the rhizosphere and on leaves, and they also have a broad range of diversity. So the viruses are ones that we all know because they make us sick, but in fact, I'm not sure that that's their only function is to be detrimental to the health of their hosts. So with the viruses, there's about a billion virions per gram of soil. So again, really, really numerous. Many of these, not many, a few of these are plant pathogens, and we see them because of the interesting things they do to the plants. Sometimes this interest is favorable, so they've been exploited for horticulture. They make our flowers pretty. Um, but in general, we tend to think of them as bad guys that are causing disease. Some of the recent um, research in this area actually shows that there's viruses that seem to cause benefit under the right situation. If you have a plant under drought, there are viruses that actually can enhance its drought tolerance, which is a different way of looking at it. We usually think of viruses as coming in on the insects, but some viruses actually appear to be transmitted to the seeds. So we're just at the tip of the iceberg of learning about the potential of this group of organisms. And then there's some of the larger organisms like algae and protists, which are somewhere around 10,000 per gram of, of soil, and then nematodes, um, which probably many of you have, don't have really fond feelings for, but those are about a, a hundred per gram of, of, of soil just on average. These are rough numbers so you can get a sense. So if you took a gram of soil and asked which microbes are most important, the answer is a difficult one to give because if you think in terms of numbers, the viruses are by far and away the most numerous. But if you think in terms of mass, the bacterial cells themselves are quite numerous and have a lot of mass, so they have the most mass. But if you think of them as the most genes and the most diversity of functions, that would be the fungi. They have the greatest number of genes in that gram of soil. So they're all important in their own way. So what I want to talk about today with these organisms is how do they really influence plant growth or productivity. Um, and I want to kind of go through some of the different mechanisms. 
the one that we think of most, because we've studied the, the most, is that microbes can help plants acquire nutrients. So we know plants need all these different nutrients, and we have to ask the question of, who are the major microbes that, that help them get any of these nutrients? So one group, as an example, would be bacteria that help plants get phosphorus. So we know that our supply of, of phosphorus in the world is, is maybe peaking or maybe past peaked. And so it's really important that we figure out other ways to get the phosphorus that's in the soil, to scavenge it. So there's a number of different rhizosphere bacteria that are able to help provide the phosphorus to the plant. And they do this by secreting organic acids that are able to solubilize the insoluble phosphorus that's in the soil. Or some of them secrete phosphatases that break the phosphate groups off of the organic matter that's in the soil. And in both cases, they're helping provide it to the plants. The other major nutrient that we think of is nitrogen. And so you have the, the diazotrophs. So these are the, the bacteria that are able to take N2 from the air and provide it to the plant. So these are only going to be bacteria. But you also have increasing evidence that mycorrhizae are able to help provide and channel nitrogen to the plant, not, not by fixing N2, but by, by taking the nitrogen that's in the soil and making it more efficiently taken up by the plant. So I wanted to, to, to talk a little bit more about the, the mycorrhizal fungi, because I think this is one of the most interesting understudied groups. It's understudied because these are tough little things to work with. They grow slowly. <laughs> They're, uh, you have to have a lot of patience. So mycorrhizal fungi, the name comes from the Greek for mycos, which is fungus, and rhiza, which is root. So the root fungus. And what I think is just so really fascinating about these is that the, the fungi can comprise up to 80% of the effective root system. So as the plants came on land and put down their roots, the mycorrhizae extended those roots and extended by 80% of what the actual root is. So as the roots go in and penetrate the soil, the mycorrhizae can go in and penetrate smaller pores in the soil. And, and, and in that sense, really distribute those roots to a much broader area. It's like a, a plant prothesis is how I think of it. <laughs> so if you, take, <laughs> if you take a single milliliter of soil, so very, very again, like the tip of your, your thumb, and you take the mycorrhizal network in there and you extend it out straight, it can cover 100 meters, so about 300 feet in that tiny little area. If that tells you anything about how dense the mycorrhizal network is, so how much it's penetrating the soil to capture the phosphorus and water that's in that soil. So this symbiosis between the mycorrhizae and the plants is thought to have evolved over 400 billion, million, 400 million years ago. As I said, at the time, the plants colonized the land. So these come in two types, the endomycorrhizae and the ectomycorrhizae. And the, the, the biggest difference is in the types of plants that they infect. So the endomycorrhizae infect um, ab about 80% of the land plant species. So that is actually most of all of our, our crops. Does anybody know what crop is not infected by mycorrhizae? <laughs> not a crop, but no, yeah, okay. <laughs> what else? The brassicas, yeah. And poppies, poppy seeds are, are not, if we think of that as a crop. 
So the endomycorrhizae are contrasted with the ectomycorrhizae. These colonize about 10% of the land plants, and most of these are, are, are trees, the woody plant species. If we look a little bit at how they do this, um, the endomycorrhizae are able to, I think they're both able to sense signal molecules put out by the plant, which allows them to come and detect where the plant is. And when they come, they're able to colonize through the plant tissue. And what's really fascinating about these ones is that they are between the plant cells, and when they get to the plant cell, they're able to form this arbuscule, which looks like a network and looks like a, a, a plant. And this has a membrane around it that's it's kind of like if you stuck your hand into a rubber balloon. It's inside, but it's not inside. <laughs> if it actually popped the balloon, your hand would not be inside. If this actually broke the plant cell, the plant cell would be dead. But it's reached in there, and it's coated with a membrane, and that membrane is filled with transporters. And those transporters are taking nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus, especially phosphorus, and moving it from the fungus and into the plant, and taking carbon and moving it from the plant and into the fungus. So it has a huge, this huge surface area of membranes to cross over the nutrients. So what makes endomycorrhizae endo is that they are inside the plant and exchanging nutrients super efficiently because they're inside the plant cell. The ectomycorrhizae don't do this. They actually form on the outside of the, of the root, and they form this, this, this mantle where the hyphae are reaching out. They're still exchanging, but I wouldn't say it's anywhere near as efficient. And it's, again, you're on a woody tissue. It's hard to get through the wood and, and, and get in. Yes? Ah, what's in it for me? So right here, about 20% of the photosynthate from the plant can end up at the, at the mycorrhizae. So it's a wonderful exchange of nutrients. So as the, 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 the fungus is providing phosphorus, nitrogen, zinc, and water, the plant is providing it with this sole source of, of carbon, which if you think about a really diverse root, all the community that's on there, and they're all duking it out for nutrients, they're getting a sole source. So they're sole sourcing their, 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 their carbon. They're, they're going right in the plant, and they're getting it before anybody else gets it. So it limits their competitive, they don't have to compete for it. So the, the smallness of their hyphae lets them get into these aggregates and really fully exhaust the water supply. So they have access to the water that's there as well as, as the phosphorus to bring it in. I think this is a picture that shows a plant that does, has the mycorrhizae and one that doesn't, and it, it can make a huge difference. The different types of carbon that the plants produce? Um, well, yeah, I mean, the plants are producing sugars, and, and, and they can be producing lipids and proteins and things, but the sugars are the main thing that they're transporting. And in fact, one of my next slide is actually I wanted to encourage questions on this. I put some up there if they interest you, but I wanted to see what questions you might have on mycorrhizae. I'm not an expert in this area, but I can do my best if you think about questions you might have. Yes? So the question is, can they be added to the soil economically or efficiently? Um, they can be added to the soil. And I know of a, a group in, in Europe that has been breeding mycorrhizae for cassava use. And so they're breeding ones that are, are really good in these environments where the cassava is grown. 
and they certainly have um, want to be using them as inoculants. And there are in Australia, they sell them as inoculants. So I'm I'm presuming that that's that's um, economical. So um, yes, I think the potential is completely there, and there are examples of where they've already been used as inoculant. Um, it's it's a little more challenging than a bacterium because they're a little harder to grow, but it can be done. Yes. So the question is, if could since the palmer amaranth doesn't colonize, if you could inoculate your crops with the mycorrhizae, would that give them a competitive edge over the palmer amaranth? And I think that's fully logical. <laughs> so yes, I mean, I think um, there's so many other things that might be going on, but at least with that direct competition, that should give them an edge in terms of water and phosphorus and, and some of these other nutrients. Yes. The question is, if you are growing no-till, if you inoculate once, should that be sufficient? Will they stay there forever? I, I wish I knew the answer to that. I, I, I don't. Um, mycorrhizae do hang out from season to season for millions of years. And <laughs> but um, different conditions influence their robustness. So it's hard to say categorically whether the conditions are most favorable to keep the inoculum levels high enough. Um, I think this is an exciting area for research, but I, I don't know the answer to that. Is using a compost tea the most effect an effective way to inoculate, um, or is there a more effective way? I would be surprised if there's very many mycorrhizae in a compost tea, because a compost tea usually has been at a high temperature, it's been a lot of degradation. You wouldn't, it wouldn't necessarily have fostered the mycorrhizae in the first place to be there. I think they would be at a real competitive disadvantage, because they're pretty slow growers compared to what you find in a compost tea. Do the fungicides kill the mycorrhizae? I'm a, I'm a, I'm, I, I know that, um, like, I, I was warned that you might be interested in glyphosate, right? So that's not a fungicide, but does that influence the mycorrhizae? Yes, it can have a detrimental effect because it, it affects a metabolic process that occurs in the mycorrhizae. So I, It'd be, I would be really surprised if many of the fungicides didn't affect mycorrhizae, but it does depend on their mode of action. And most importantly, do they get there, right? Because applying it on the surface doesn't necessarily get it, and how much can you lose? So again, kind of a complicated answer. Yes. Can we uh, evaluate the mycorrhizal content in the field? Um, yes, we can. And actually, later in the talk, I'll be presenting some of the techniques that we've been using to, to look at that. Um, and yes, that's a very answerable. Yes. <laughs> so, so the, I'm not going to repeat the first part, but how, how species specific is the mycorrhizae with the crop species? And surprisingly, not very specific. So people have taken the mycorrhizae from a field that's got, that's got maybe weeds and put it in. And if there's a lot of mycorrhizae, they're not very species specific, which is 
completely different than the rhizobium I'll talk about. So that should work to our advantage. Yes, yes. There's like 200 species of mycorrhizae, but they don't necessarily differ by the host specificity. They differ by their, their taxonomy and their, their evolution. Yes, we'll make this our last question. So the question is, because there's so many microbes in a compost tea, if a compost is managed correctly, might you have the mycorrhizae? I guess I would, I would still be very skeptical because a mycorrhizae is an organism that's growing on a living plant. It has a membrane where it's exchanging nutrients. It's getting its nutrients because the plant is photosynthesizing. It's hard for me to picture how, how a mycorrhizae could live in a, in a compost tea because it doesn't have the living plant. That's not an environment I would expect to find one. Okay. Okay. Last question of mycorrhizae for me. Okay. So, so, the, the, so the, the statement is that the mycorrhizae might still be in the extract. And that's, I don't know what goes into making that extract. I just, I think it has, there has to be a living plant somewhere along the production line in order for there to be the potential to have an organism that's dependent on a living plant in there. That would be how I would look at it. <laughs> okay, truly last question on my grade. <laughs> Um, so usually for something like this, you would have roots that have, Im spores is the most common way, right? So you would take spores from a soil. So if you have a soil that you know have had mycorrhizae, take some of that soil as inoculum, unless you're worried about pathogens. And then maybe you want to take roots that have some of the mycorrhizae. But the, but the spores from the mycorrhizae are the best structures for, for spreading. Okay, so the... The other organisms that have been studied quite a bit are nitrogen-fixing bacteria. So in terms of providing nutrients, we know that nitrogen is often the primary factor limiting growth. Um, we know that bacteria are the only organisms that can take atmospheric nitrogen gas and convert it into a form that's now available to a plant. And we also know that of the world's supply of fixed nitrogen, about 65% about of it is fixed by bacteria, about 10% is fixed by lightning, combustion, and volcanoes, and showing man's prowess, about 25% actually comes from an industrially fixed nitrogen, which is a really impressive number because this is on a global basis. So this, we know that in the production of this nitrogen, it releases an awful lot of CO2 into the environment. Using it has some downstream effects. So I think the more that we can offset this or complement our use of nitrogen fertilizers with nitrogen fixation, the better off agriculture is. If we start looking at the different types of nitrogen fixing organisms, the first type I want to mention are what we call associative nitrogen fixers. These are bacteria that fix nitrogen while associated with plants, but not necessarily um, in a, a tight mutualism. So Azosporillum, Azotobacter, these are organisms that might colonize the root. The, the, the enzyme that, that converts nitrogen in the air into ammonia is very sensitive to oxygen. So they have to, they have, to have adaptations that allow them to do this. So it might be like a biofilm or a, a thick area where you have low oxygen um, um, dissolution into that in the roots. But 
I have up there, they only provide some nitrogen because one, nitrogen fixation is a really energy intensive process. And so it's hard for a plant to get enough nutrients to these nitrogen fixers to support nitrogen fixation. You see this, it, they work really well in sugarcane because in sugarcane you have a huge amount of sugar. Um, and they also are, are maybe in the roots and not in tight association with the plant. So as they fix it, it might go to another microbe before it gets to the plant. That said, I know in the early part of the last century in Russia, they had large train cars filled with these azotobacter or azospirillum, these associative fixers, and they would take them out and spray them on their, their cereal crops because there is some potential to enhance the nitrogen with using these organisms. The ones most of us are familiar with are those that form these tight, very specific associations with the plant, the symbiotic fixers. These can fix a lot of nitrogen and the organisms are in close association with the plant so they have a good chance to transfer it. So the rhizobium legume mutualism is the one that we would be most familiar with here in Iowa because of our soybeans. And as it turns out, this has been known thousands of years. The Romans knew that if you grew something that was a legume, it seemed to do something to the soil that if you took that soil in a wheelbarrow or whatever into another field and spread it, you transferred the benefit. They didn't know it was the microbes, but they knew there was the benefit. This has been used for a long time. I love this mutualism just because of the sheer beauty of it. When you think about what's happening, again, the plant is putting out a signal molecule like for the mycorrhizae. The bacteria produce a signal molecule back that when the plant senses it, it actually creates a tunnel through its root hairs and lays down a path for the bacteria to come into the plant. It's, it's making a membrane, it puts a cell wall around it, and the bacteria then go through this tunnel, and as they go through the tunnel, the plant actually brings its nucleus up and guides this tunnel all the way down through the cell to the next cell where it parts ways and keeps building the tunnel. And then when you get this, it's called the infection thread through the nodule, the bacteria again are able to move into the plant cell by coating themselves with a membrane, just like they do, the mycorrhizae do. And once they're in there, that's where they can start to um, figure out a way to lower the oxygen level so they can fix nitrogen. They do that by producing a, a heme, an iron containing molecule, and then the plant is producing its globin, which together comes to form a hemoglobin, which we call the legume hemoglobin, the leg hemoglobin. And if that is bound to oxygen, it turns nice and red, just like our blood. That means that the oxygen has been removed and the enzyme can start fixing nodules. So if you pull up your soybean and you see nodules and you cut open a nodule and it's white, that nodule's not doing anything yet. But if you cut it open and it's red, you have nitrogen fixation going on. It's a nice quick test. Those are not the only symbiotic nitrogen fixing organisms. You also have actinobacteria. So these are a completely different kind of bacteria, but they also induce nodules. They do it on trees and shrubs, alders, cyanothus, and they do the same thing. Once they're in there, they're fixed nitrogen for the tree. And this has been really important for re reclaiming polluted soils because the tree roots can go really deep and the, the microbes can help um, provide the nutrients that are not in these really degraded soils. The last symbiosis I want to mention is with cyanobacteria, which are bacteria that that are like little plants, they're photosynthesizing, and they interact with the symbiotic bacterium that fixes nitrogen. And these are really wonderful in rice patties. So if you have rice and you have water that's in the, the rice, as they do in their rice patties, you have this floating fern. It's, it's, it's like the size of my pinky fingernail. It's a really small fern. 
And in the base of that fern, you have these cyanobacteria that get into that. And this, this called a zola. And you get this whole green, it looks like um, duckweed, except this is in a rice field. And that has these cyanobacteria that are fixing nitrogen. And so if at the end of a rice growing season, you take out the rice, and then you, the water dries, all of that fern goes down. And it's essentially a green manure. So if they incorporate it into the soil, you get all the nitrogen that was fixed by the cyanobacteria. So these are, are, are really important in other parts of the world. So one of the things that's come out is how sophisticated the interactions are between plants and individual microbes. Mycorrhizae, as we said earlier, are not very species specific. They, they'll infect whatever plant. And if you have a root and you have a mycorrhiza strain, I'm going to call it strain A, and it infects the root, and another strain that infects that same root in another portion. If strain B provides more phosphorus to the plant than strain A, the plant turns around and gives strain B more sugars. The plant can tell the benefit it's getting from the microbe, and it responds in turn. And this is true with rhizobium. If you have a rhizobium strain that's fixing more nitrogen, the plant will target more of its resources to the, their dicarboxylate molecules to the, to the rhizobium, and that strain will benefit. So this is the, the, the principle of, um, of maximum reciprocal rewards. You help me, I help you. The implication of this is that we not only can breed our plants for better plants, but we should be able to breed our microbes for better microbes. <laughs> it's not just any mycorrhiza you want to put on the field, because some of them are poor at doing this. You want to put good ones. <laughs> And we aren't in a great point in research that we've, we, we haven't had 100 years of microbe breeding like we had plant breeding. So I think the potential is here. We know how to do this, but it, we're just trying to make sure we can get enough money to do this kind of breeding. OK, I'm going to open it up again for maybe if there's questions on nitrogen fixing symbioses. Yes. So the question is, in natural systems, how much selection is there for the ones that are providing the most benefit to the plant? Um, we don't actually know the answer to that, so I can only speculate. But my speculation would be that there's a great diversity, because there hasn't necessarily been a selection pressure for just the ones that provide something good, because there's different plants. and So I, I think it would be a mix. No, I'm not. But I mean, it, in, in their work, it, it sounds like you're describing, it's describing work that some humates are better than others at, at promoting benefits to the plant. And in some ways, it looks like some of it's happening by increasing root growth, which increases the symbiosis, which increases the benefit. And in general, when you increase root growth, you often increase opportunities for infection. And so just the very fact of increasing root growth, you tend to have more nodules because you have more sites for, for infection. And I'm guessing the same thing would happen with mycorrhizae. I don't know why the humates would do it, but if they did it, I think that's why you get the benefit. So how much does, the, does rhizobial inoculation um, need be, if you already have these bacteria in the soil? So this actually is what I did my PhD thesis on. And that was that an awful lot of the Brady rhizobium and the rhizobium that's in the soil is um, really competitive for forming nodules, but really poor at fixing nitrogen once it gets there. So again, it gets back to some strains are better than others. And the more competitive we have strains that don't fix nitrogen, the harder it is for you to get a benefit from the inoculum you put in. So the next question would be, how distributed are these, are these 
poorly fixing good competing bacteria. And I don't have a really good sense for that. So um, even if, if you put inoculant in and, and it doesn't form very many nodules, but if those nodules that have formed fix well, you probably have a benefit. So not a great answer, but <laughs> yes. So does a perennial need to be continually cut because that's going to influence the, the pruning of its roots to form new nodules? I'm, I'm formulating my answer. So the, with an annual, what we see is that you get a flush of nodules, they live their existence, they die and you get a flush of nodules and you get nodules kind of like a Christmas tree effect. With a perennial, most of the perennials are nodules that continually get longer and longer and longer, but they do have a finite lifespan. But I, I guess I don't know anything about whether you, if you prune the top, if it has any direct implication of what happens below. So I'm not sure I can answer that. So what's the imp so what's the impact of the nitrogen fertilizer on the cyanobacterial azola symbiosis that's in rice? And could it be using nitrogen fertilizer? Could we be decreasing the benefit that we could be having from that symbiosis? Um, so you probably know that if you're talking about about um, soybean or bean, if you provide nitrogen, that suppresses nodulation. In a cyanobacterial azola symbiosis, if, if you had, I, I don't know if the answer is known, because the question would be, if you had a lot of, of nitrogen in the water around the azola, would the azola save its resources by not entering into the symbiosis? Which goes into how much energy does it take to make the symbiosis? So for a, a, a soybean or a bean plant, it has a lot of energy because it's basically making a whole new organ. It's like getting a new arm because the, or, the, the bacterium is there. And so it puts a lot of energy into making this new organ. For the azola cyanobacteria, the cyanobacteria kind of slides into this cavity, and it's a far less energy requiring symbiosis because it's not developing a new organ. So my guess is that it may not be as sensitive, and it may continue to do this even if there's nitrogen around. But I'd, I'd have to look into that for you. I can, I can look it up, but I don't know. <laughs> yes? It makes sense, and I, I, that I've, I'm fascinated with that question and have no idea the answer. I keep trying to figure that out by reading. So if you, if you fixed a certain amount of, of nitrogen and it's in the plant, basically how much will, will leave that plant and carry into the next season? And so, oh. So if you put clover in, that it's going to be providing nitrogen in that very season over to the next plant. I think it's possible, but not in the way that we're thinking. Okay, So I don't think it's likely that a nodule on a clover plant that fixes nitrogen, and that nitrogen goes to the plant, that there's any reason that plant would ever deliver that nitrogen down to the ground for just the heck of it. I, the plants don't do that, right? So the plant's going to be greedy and keep that nitrogen. But mycorrhizae aren't picky about what plant species they interact with. So it's possible to have a mycorrhizal infection on this root 
and on this root and have them be a clover and your crop plant. And the mycorrhizae can function to redistribute the wealth. And because they're in tight association, it's possible that they, I mean, I, we don't usually think of the mycorrhizae as taking the nitrogen, but we don't really know. If you had a nodule nearby and had an excess of nitrogen, there's no reason it might not transfer over. So there may be more to the picture. Yes. So the question is, is there research being done on cover crops and the and the the ability of the microbes that are associated with the cover crops to help transfer the nitrogen or fix the nitrogen and get it to the next crop. Lots, make it more available. Lots of research, not answers. <laughs> I think we're right on the early side of that. I know based on the research I've done on, on cover crops in trying to understand the impact of the cover crop on the microbiome and the, the, the whole microbial community. It's a really complex community, and I think we'll get there, but we've only had the tools, and, and I'll talk about those tools in a little bit, but we've only had the tools for a short time to start really addressing that. So I, we don't really know yet. Okay, last question on nitrogen fixation. So I haven't heard of it. So can I speculate on why in the Kanza prairie the soybean did not form nodules in legumes? So the legumes didn't form nodules in the prairie, but if you took them out, they did. And it sounds like it could be a classic case of there's enough nitrogen to inhibit, right? Because so, so when the symbiosis starts, it starts with this infection thread, and if there's a high amount of nitrogen already in the plant, it aborts the infection thread and you never see a nodule develop. But if you took it out and put it in a low nitrogen environment, that suppression signal would be gone and you would get a nodule. That would be the most obvious. But there, yeah. So the comment here is if you, when they do strip tests with, with, with manure and cover crops, if they have a high manure, they are not seeing nodules, suggesting that it is, in fact, suppressing the formation of nodules on those cover crops. All right. We're going to keep on going here. Oh, one more question. So you're saying a plant could put, could put so much energy in the nodules that it would decrease its yield? I don't know. In, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a world where you picture Mother Nature has optimized everything, the answer would be no. The plant would not do that to itself. It would not overindulge on the nitrogen at the cost of photosynthate. But we've also been selecting seeds for Lord knows what, right? And so we, we aren't necessarily working with, with the perfect system where the plant is, is in tune with everything. So it's possible that, that you have a, a, a plant that's responding in a way that's, that's working against itself. Because we can make mutants like that easily. So, but that's a guess. OK, so we have talked a lot here about a big thing, which is how plants, how microbes can help plants acquire nutrients. But let's look at some of the other things that the microbes can do. Um, there's a lot of pathogens that affect the plant, and th those are caused by microbes. So if you think of microbe on microbe warfare, microbes are really good at helping protect the plants from other microbes that cause diseases. I just put up here some pictures of some of my favorite diseases, like my favorite, the exploding watermelon. Sorry if you raise watermelon, but for the rest of us, it's really cool. You have a watermelon out in the field, and the acidophorex gets in, and poof, it explodes and spews out all this white stuff. Um, <laughs> there's, there's also the, the plants that form witch's broom, and if you put that in a saguaro cacti, cactus, that's pretty cool too, right? You get this big handy. So, so the diseases in themselves, we don't really like, except they're fun. Um, but if we want the microbes that help suppress the diseases, there's different ways to go about this. And one, one 
grower's dream come true is that you have a disease suppressive soil. Right? You have a soil that for whatever reason you may not understand simply does not support a particular disease in, in your particular crop. So this has happened, for example, with the most famous case, take-all decline of wheat. If they grow wheat in these fields over and over, year after year, take-all declined. It was, a, it was a disease that took everything, and suddenly there wasn't that disease anymore. And people are studying this with Rhizoctonia bear patch of wheat in Australia and, and other systems. And, and some of the time, in these cases, it's because of a microbial shift. They have enriched for microbes that are um, in successful warfare against the pathogens. And with the take all, it's, it's, they're producing a particular strain of, or type of molecule that's killing the, the fungus. These are good soils to try and find the microbes that are actually working against the pathogen and so are, are possible to use as inoculants for biological control. These are just some examples from my colleague up in, in um, Minnesota. She works with potato scab, and so without a, an, a biocontrol agent, you get nice scabby potatoes, and with it, you get potatoes you'd actually want to buy. Um, same thing on alfalfa. So if we delve into this a little further about what are the microbes doing when they're effective in biocontrol, I wanted to give you some examples of the kinds of things, because this is an area that a lot of research has gone into. So microbes can obviously kill some pathogens, or, but may, they might also be able to exclude them or outcompete them. So in a, a case like this where you have a um, petri dish, you have one microbe and you've got a zone of clearing around it and that's something like antibiotic production where they're, they're uh, secreting something that kills the other. But that can also be, this one is secreting something that binds iron better. Nitrogen may be really limiting for plants, but iron is really limiting for microbes. And so they have a lot of warfare about who can scavenge the iron the best. And the one that can more successfully scavenge the iron can usually grow more. And if it can scavenge enough iron, it can actually kill or at least starve the pathogen to death. Bacteriophage. These are viruses of bacteria. And these can kill the bacterial cells and can be effective for biocontrol. This has been used quite effectively in greenhouse grown tomatoes in Florida, where they have a bacterial disease of the leaves, and you can spray the phage out. And the nice thing is, these bacteriophage are very specific to that pathogen. So it's, it has very few non target effects. I actually have some research where I'm really interested in whether we could use this to get the bacteriophage into the xylem fluid to protect squash and cucumbers um, from a bacterial wilt. There's fungi that predate on other fungi, so they parasitize either the fungi. So if you see here, trichoderma is a very big success story in the biological control world because it's a fungus that actually controls a lot of other fungi. It can go around them, strangle it, pierce holes, lice them. It can kill, it can kill other fungi in lots and lots of ways. There are predatory fungi that can attack nematodes. So here's the nematode and here's almost a lasso. Um, that's all I'm going to say about biological control, but I'll, I'll, we'll ask questions on after the next section. So another thing that I think is interesting is that microbes can help the plants to defend themselves. So this happens most when a microbe gets into a plant, it induces the plant genes that are involved in the defense against other pathogens, like fungi or viruses, or other pests, like nematodes or insects. So if you have an inoculant of bacteria that you put on the roots down here, that can cause a systemic signal to spread through the plant. And when it gets up in here, it's inducing its defenses 
So whatever pest or pathogen that comes on later has no effect. So this is induced systemic resistance, and it's a, it's a very exciting form of resistance. We've known for a long time that if you have a pathogen, it induces systemic acquired resistance. It, in, it induces a resistance against other pathogens, but you have to have a pathogen there, so that's not fun. This is a type of resistance that's induced by a bacterium that isn't a, a pathogen. Yes, it is. It's, it's like the theory of being vaccinated, um, except when we get vaccinated, there's very, very little negative consequences, despite the media. It's, it's a very, very low risk thing. There's a, there could be a lot of energy that's spent on this. So people, when they discovered this, tried to figure out, could we just spray on a, um, a molecule, and there are various molecules that induce the systemic resistance and basically vaccinate our plants. But that does come at an energy cost because the plants are deploying a lot of different defenses. And if they don't need them and you do that over a long time, there can be an energy drain. So we're still working on how do you get the right balance. Yes? A high what? Brick. Oh. Is there any relationship between induced systemic resistance and an idea of inducing high sugar content um, helps defense? I, I, I don't know about that, but high sugar content in itself would help defense because microbes don't grow well in high sugar content. So that in itself probably is the mechanism. So the microbes themselves can produce compounds that protect the plants. So there's, for example, these grass endophytes that cause livestock staggers, if you've heard about them. So these endophytes, so these are fungi that grow within a grass. They produce these alkaloid compounds that themselves are good because they protect the, the grass against seed predators. They help um, the plant defend itself against pathogens, but it also helps the plant defend it against, against vertebrates and invertebrates. So cattle grazing, herbivore, herbivore, herbivore insects grazing, and these can have pretty serious consequences of toxicosis and livestock staggers. So from the plant perspective, <laughs> these are pretty cool microbes. From a grower's perspective, with cattle, not so cool. But even then, by understanding this well enough, there are, there's an Australian firm that was able to establish um, an, an inoculant of an endophyte that when you apply it to the grasses, competes the, against um, this endophyte enough that it actually can prevent the livestock staggers, but still allow some of the other benefits. So they were able to get the right competition there. OK, before I go into the environmental stresses, are there questions about biological control or induction of, of defenses in plants? Yes? Can I comment about time of day and in insect resistance? I think I need a little more information. Mm -hmm. um, so at different times of the day, the different sugar content may be associated with different susceptibilities to insect damage. I believe that. <laughs> um, I don't know if microbes have any impact on that. And I'm not sure how you use that information. But, but it, it's, it's, a, it's a cool discovery. Yes. Oh, oh. So the trichoderma, when it's used as a biological control, does it 
preferentially attack only the bad guys, only the pathogens, but leave beneficial fungi in place. It's a little complicated. It, I've seen the companies that are making the trichoderma, and they have to screen hundreds of trichoderma strains to come up with the ones that they choose. So there is a lot of specificity in what they're going for. So I think it's unlikely that a product that's aiming at a pathogen is going to hit a non-target beneficial. So there is specificity because it's been selected for. So that's not to say there aren't trichoderma that could attack everything, but they wouldn't have selected for that as a product. Yes. Yeah, so, so the question is, is this similar to other kind of chemical exchange warfare that's involved in, in bringing maybe parasitoids to feed on insects? Absolutely. So that what, what we're learning that's so interesting is that there are all these volatile signals that are put out. And the volatile signals um, can influence, yes, one plant to another plant, the plant to an insect. There's viruses in insects that make the, make when the plant delivers the virus, no. When the insect delivers the virus to the plant, the plant has a, 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 a chemical signature that's inviting that insect. But once the virus is in it, it changes the chemical signal so that the, the insect now leaves. So it's a way the virus is manipulating the plant to spread the virus from one plant to another. First, bring my insect host now. Now get rid of me and take me someplace else. So. The sophistication of the signaling is, is phenomenal. And, it, and it's plants put out volatiles, microbes, viruses, the, the, the insects, and all of those are, are, are interacting. Yeah. Yes. So the question is, well, are there things you could do to increase the microbes? And are there things you should be avoiding because they're going to have a detrimental impact? I, it, it's too complicated for that because it's not like all microbes are the same. So the question is how can we best amplify the beneficial microbes without amplifying the negative ones? Um, and we aren't at a point where I can tell you that. <laughs> um, and, and in terms of negative, well, I'll talk a little bit about it, but I mean, like if you take mycorrhizae, if you, if you, if you have no till, you're going to have more mycorrhizae than if you plow a lot, because when you plow a lot, you're breaking up the, 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 the hyphae, right? And that takes them longer to recover. But we know that, that if, you, if you have no till, you might also have more pathogens. I mean, it's just, it's all an interconnected system. And so I'll talk a little bit more. Maybe, maybe you can ask that question again at the end if I haven't addressed it a little bit more when we look at kind of a systems approach, which which gets at this kind of signaling. There's, there's signaling, and, and the more we understand that, the more we're going to be better at manipulating it. Yes? Sorry. Yeah. Can I say anything about the fact that there's some beneficial nematodes, that they're not all bad? That's all I could say. <laughs> Nematodes are my area. I know they're not all bad. I know some are good, but I actually don't know much about them. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about how microbes can help plants tolerate environmental stresses. This is an increasing area of concern as the, the climate is causing major water events, whether it's flooding or drought. We have a lot more salinity because in areas that are irrigated, maybe not close to here, but if you're irrigating, you have more salinity. And the reality is that plants can't move. Microbes can. <laughs> because once a plant sets its roots, the only thing that it can change is how it grows or who it interacts with. The microbes are the potential partner to buffer some of these effects. And this has been true forever. So when we grow our crops in, in ideal conditions, 
give them all the nutrients they need and a perfect amount of water, the microbes are not all that relevant, if you ask me, for the most part. But when you grow those plants under anything that's not ideal, they don't have enough nutrients, they don't have enough water, they have too much water, now provides the opportunity for the mutualisms that have evolved to really kick in and help the plants. So there's lots of partnerships that are, are known, and these partnerships are between plants and microbes, but they're also between microbes and microbes. Um, an interesting, well, I'll get to that, that story in a little bit, but if we look at some of the ways this works, so if we look at drought, for example, the mycorrhizae extend the root system, right? There you have some kind of protection from drought because you have access to more water. So any microbe that enhances plant root growth helps a, at least somewhat against drought. A lot of bacteria are known to produce plant growth hormones. And these plant growth hormones can extend roots. Microbes can produce all sorts of things that, in, that increase plant root growth. And actually, another part of my research is we're looking at microbial products that maybe change the root system architecture, but it's, it's early. So when plants get stressed, they produce a lot of ethylene, and that ethylene reduces their growth. So there's a, a, a surprisingly large number of bacteria that produce an enzyme that breaks down the precursor to ethylene, preventing the plant from making this stress hormone, and then the plant keeps growing. In the short term, that might be good, maybe even in the long term, but it certainly seems to help increase their tolerance. Microbes can form biofilms, so those things I showed you on the roots that have polysaccharides that bind water. They're basically coating that root with a hydrated layer. And that itself helps reduce ion movement into the plant, so if you're talking about salinity stress, and helps keep the, the roots moister. Sometimes people don't appreciate the extent to which plants help clean the soils. So the whole function of a plant in, in, in um, bringing water, the water is evaporating from the leaf, and as it evaporates from the leaf, it's pulling more water through the plant, which is pulling water to the roots. As it pulls water to the roots, it's bringing in all of the soluble pollutants that are in the soil toward the plant. And as it brings those in, it's cleansing the soil, and then it's bringing those pollutants to the root surface, which is loaded with lots of different microbes that can help break it down. They already are getting sugars and good things from the plant so that they have the resources to break down the pollutant. So pollutants are transported up through the transpiration stream, and they're degraded by the active microbes in the rhizosphere. So this is what we call phytoremediation, and it's, it's really important and happening all the time. Um, in areas that have heavy metals, the same kind of thing happens except that the microbes are really good at transforming those heavy metals into a non-toxic state. So arsenic and selenium on, on rice, the microbes are very important for reducing the um, uptake of those heavy metals into that rice. Temperature, we don't really worry about this so much, but <laughs> This study was really cool because it took place in Yellowstone National Park, where now and then the magma underneath causes a crack in the, it opens up a new crack, and suddenly you have heat coming up to the ground surface that there wasn't before. So some researchers noticed that on this hillside, the plants that used to be lush suddenly were all dying because suddenly there was heat coming up from underneath the hill. But there was one grass that wasn't dying at all. It was doing really quite well. So they brought this grass in and started to study it and realized that inside this grass it had, there was a, a fungus. And if the fungus was in the grass, the grass was tolerant to the heat and grew. But if you took the fungus out, the grass didn't grow. What was cooler than that was they found a virus that was in the fungus. Now, if the virus is in the fungus, the fungus and the plant tolerate heat. But if you take the virus out, everyone dies. 
So it's this multi-level interaction that was only figured out because they were patient enough and looked at this. This, this guy actually is help, heading up one of the big um, ag microbiome firms in, um, in Massachusetts at the moment. But so this turned out not to be true with, or to be true not only with the grass, but here he did it with tomatoes. So if it was not infected, most of them died in black when you heated them. If you just had the fungus, but if you had the fungus and the virus, only a, a small percentage of them died. So things we get to discover. Okay, and the last one that I want to highlight is that microbes can help plants grow better. So even if you don't have pests, you don't have stresses, you don't have pathogens, the microbes, there are microbes that enhance plant growth. We call them plant growth promoting rhizobacteria or endophytic fungi. Some of the ways they do this we're still figuring out. Sometimes it's, it's fixing nitrogen in this associative fashion. Producing plant growth hormones. It's, there's about seven different plant growth hormones that microbes have been found to have gotten those genes and produced. Some of them are producing small molecules or even volatile compounds. There's a wonderful study where you have a petri plate, you put seeds on one side, you put microbes on the other. The only thing that can get from those microbes to the seeds is a volatile, and you see some of them that grow big and bushy. And it's the microbes are producing volatiles that help the plant. So the, the, the signaling is highly evolved. So we know that in the in a situation where you get nodules, we've identified the compounds from the plant. We've identified the compounds from the bacteria. They each recognize each other. It's the same thing in, in, a, in a disease situation. Um, so this, this chemical signaling is evolved. And one of the, the discoveries that's been really exciting is that when you have a lot of microbes in a community, they're signaling with each other. And there's certain signals that when they reach a certain threshold, it changes the, it, it, it turns something on. So this was discovered early with this bacterium that colonizes roots, that when you get enough of these bacteria, they suddenly start turning the, on the production of an antibiotic. So the, kind of the idea is that when there's enough of them, they produce an antibiotic to kill their competitors. So this antibiotic happens to be orange, which was really nice because you could ask the question, how many organisms in the, in, on the roots tell this organism to start producing an antibiotic? Does it only tell itself, or are there other organisms that make these same signal molecules? So they put this on a Petri plate, and then they put other microbes from the, from the rhizosphere. And the ones that turned bright orange were organisms that told the other one make the antibiotic or signaled it. So basically, you end up with this big crosstalk. There was out of 700 microbes, I think about 20% of them made molecules that were recognized by the other. So these aren't, aren't working as individuals. They're kind of working as a collection. If you look further and do this in a different way, you can find organisms that interrupt the communications between those microbes. These are what we call quenchers. And there was a lot of those too. So they interrupt the talking between the microbes. And what was even cooler is that it was discovered that plants can produce these same compounds, which basically make the microbes turn on things like the production of the antibiotic or other things early, and the plants also produce antagonists to them. So th all the chemical signaling that's happening has been listened in by the plant, and it's figured out how to intercept it. So you end up with this big communication network. <laughs> and what we're trying to do is figure out how to, how to understand it and how to use it. So what I want to spend my last 10 minutes on, and I'm, I'm glad we've had questions along the way, is how can we, in, we capture the benefits of these plant microbe associations? 
And, and one that's obvious is, is through microbial-based products. So we have more companies than ever that are trying to produce agricultural microbes. And um, it's a big industry. They, they I'm not going to go through all the, the finances of it, but let's just, let's just say there's, there's a lot of potential there to produce microbes that could be sold. But I myself like the idea of using the knowledge to better manage our lands instead of just applying a new microbe, because the microbe you want is probably already there. <laughs> I'd rather understand how to get to it. So if we can apply knowledge of the whole community, we can Im hopefully improve the, the tillage, the crop rotation, the inputs. And to do this, we have to shift our understanding of agriculture to understanding not just the plant genes or the input, but the system, which obviously most of you guys are already there, but I'm not sure that enough of the world is. So this is what we call um, the phytobiome, that the whole plant biome is a system. And the microbial component is the least understood, but we know that these microbes are affecting how the plant interacts with arthropods and animals, which affects the soil. It's, it's a network. It's a system. And if you could add more, I mean, one, one of the research that I really like from a, from a colleague is if she wants to, to outcompete a pathogen, she knows this group of organisms outcompetes this pathogen. And so she's found that if you add this type of straw, it promotes this group, which outcompetes the pathogen. You don't need to add the pathogen. You need to add what the pathogen, what the, what the outcompeters need. So there's lots of ways to tweak this if we understand it. We've got a lot of tools. As I say, the microbes are the least understood in the system, the most complex. This is just an overview if you are interested in, in technologically. The, the things that we've not been able to do until now, what's making the world different for us, is that we can take whole communities and take the DNA out of them. And then we can do what we call amplicon sequencing, where every cell in that whole community is represented by a short piece of DNA. And that piece of DNA tells us who's there. So we might have a bacterium that has 4,000 genes, but we're looking at one part of one gene, and that tells us that organism is there. So we can take what's, what's like all the stars in the sky, that's about what you have in a gram of soil, and you can say, these are all the organisms that are there. Then we can sequence all of the other genes in there now, and we can say, what can they do? How many antibiotic-producing genes do I see? How many nitrogen fixation genes do I see? And then we can actually take the RNA, which tells us what genes they're expressing, and do the same thing, and that says not only what can they do, but what are they doing. So we have these tools to take these communities and actually probe them. And I'm not kind of, I thought I'd give you just a little sense of what we end up with. This is like a census. So when I take it from a root and I look at all these microbes, I, I can identify this all the way down to a very specific level. And I can say, in this community, it's 0.04% of all of the cells in this community are this organism. And when I do this from a root, I had 10,249 organisms in this particular study. So it's, the total is 100%. But it's a complex community. Then I can look at each community and say, if I take all my communities from the soil and all mine from along the root and all of those from inside the root, and I can see how overall similar or dissimilar they are, I see that the communities in the soil are really different than the communities inside the root. So it, it gives me a tool to measure that. And then I can say, how are these community members interacting with each other? So if they occur together a lot on all my treatments, then they might be what I would call a neighborhood, like all these three little blue dots here, might be one group of organisms that are interacting with each other. And then I can look at what genes they have. So I can start to see how do these communities form. And, and, and I'm going to 
with that. And using those tools, we can start to try and understand how the plant is selecting for the community, how the soil is selecting for the community. And I think the third thing that I really would like to see is that we look at plants from the perspective of how they're enriching and selecting for the beneficial organisms. So can we modify the genetics of our plants so that they have genes that select for good organisms? So I, I did a, a study where I looked at not the plant genes, but just under, if I grow plants under drought and I look at the community, and then I take the plant away and I put another plant in and I grow it again, and I do this over and over, do I get a community at the end that helps that plant tolerate drought? And, and I can do that, and I, I, I found yes, and then I found certain organisms. I find those organisms form these, these, these networks where they interact with each other. And altogether, it says that there's a lot of potential. <laughs> so that's my main point. There's a lot of potential for us to look at the interactions of the plant genes and the microbes. So I'm, this is my final slide that I want to um, conclude with. And the question is, how can the potential benefits of plant microbe associations be captured to enhance crop production? I think we, might, we have the potential to breed plants for beneficial communities. I think we have the ability to develop biologicals, whether they're microbes that are added or other things that are added that enrich for the microbes. And ideally, we have oops, sorry, a, a better sense of how to predict soil health based on the microbial community, so diagnostics for our soils. We have the ability to design improved management practices based on knowledge. So I've been trying to look at how crop rotation influences the microbiome and how that um, could correlate to plant benefits. It takes a lot of work, but I think that that's going to be useful. And last, um, we have visions of being able to incorporate biological information into the precision agriculture tools, if anybody's using those. So if you have a tractor that's going through the field and it knows exactly where to put a certain amount of nitrogen, could it also know to deliver a seed that's got a certain microbe on it into this area because it's low phosphorus, but into this area it's got a different problem. So you could deliver seeds at a variable rate and different types of seeds to different areas. So we, I'm with a group of people where we actually put together a, a, um, a road map for the phytobiome. And the idea was if we can have more understanding of how microbes fit in the system, that we could improve agriculture. And so that whole report, and it's, it's meant for the general public, we translate it into lots of languages. It's at that um, website there. So I talked a little long, but I'm really, you guys had wonderful questions. If you have some final questions, I'm happy to take them if we have time. Okay, we have time for a few. Yes. Yeah. If you, if you, know, what you're, if you know what you're doing, they're very manipulatable. And that, that's why I think the more we know, the more we can ex exploit them. Great. Any other last questions? What happens to the mycorrhizal fungi in the wintertime? They form spores, and the spores sit there and wait till the spring, and a new root comes, and then they germinate and, and go forward. Yeah. Thank you all. You have wonderful questions. You put my students to shame. <laughs>